enjoyed that, say amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Barry. I invite you to take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 15. Today we conclude our journey, a part five in a series of messages tracing the Red Sea account in the book of Exodus. The journey commenced with worship and yet culminates as we shall see today, in worship. As I've said each week, the difference between worry and worship resides in our focus. When we focus upon our situations, when we focus upon ourselves, we grow anxious, we worry. But when we get a new perspective and focus upon God, we have a tendency to worship. Indeed, the theme of this series has been our outlook in life is not dependent upon our circumstances. It is dependent, rather, upon our focus. A.W. Tozer once wrote, If we would bring back spiritual power to our lives... We must begin to think of God more nearly as He is. I ask you this question this morning. What comes to mind whenever you think about God? A kindergarten teacher told everyone to draw a picture of what was important to them. In the back of the room sat little Billy. Billy began to labor over his drawing. Everybody else finished and handed in their picture, but he didn't. He was still drawing. The teacher graciously walked back and put her arm around Billy's shoulder and said, Billy, what are you drawing? He didn't look look up. He just kept on working feverishly at his picture. What are you drawing, Billy? I'm drawing God. Billy replied, but Billy said the teacher. No one knows what God looks like. And he answered, they will when I'm through. (laughs) What comes to mind when you think about God? I believe we'd be surprised if we asked one another that question. A lot of people have a distorted view of God. Some people see God as all loving. Other people view God as full of vengeance. Truth is, He's both. And I hope that your image of God, your picture of God, has been shaped somewhat through this series of messages. Because we've learned first that God is all wise. Consequently, we can trust Him. He is trustworthy. We can trust Him. Second, we noted that God is present. God is present. He always goes before us and with us. He guides us and He guards us. Third, we learned that God is sovereign. That is, He is in complete control. He's never caught off guard. He's never taken by surprise. Fourth, we learn that God is powerful. God fights for and God delivers His children. Consequently, we have no need to panic amid life struggles. Instead, we must maintain a proper perspective and keep our focus on our omnipotent God. Today's text is Exodus 15 verses 1 through 18, and it captures in song the heartfelt praise of the children of Israel as they rejoiced in God's goodness. God is good, and consequently, He always does what is good. 
He always does what is best for you and me. Moreover, all goodness finds its origin in God. God is good. He is worthy of our praise. That's what I want to focus on this morning. One theologian said it like this, Not a day should pass without God's people pausing to acknowledge that the Lord is good and that they are the recipients of His good gifts. We have so much of God's goodness for which to be thankful. Our lives, our salvation, our family, our friends, our food, our shelter, our church, our opportunities for ministry. The list is endless. So I want us to focus today on this characteristic of God, namely, God is good, He is worthy of our praise. I invite you to stand with me if you can, and we'll look together today at Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 18. The Bible says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentst forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Did you catch that? God sent forth his wrath. If I were to ask you this morning, are you saved? Someone might respond, saved from what? What are we saved from? We're saved from the wrath of Almighty God. That's what I'm saved from. That's what the Bible says you're saved from. We're saved from God's wrath. I no longer have to deal with a God of vengeance because I've been born into the family of God. He's now my Father, not my judge. I no longer have to deal with a God of wrath. I have to deal with my heavenly Father who will always chasten me when I do wrong, but He will chasten me in love for my good and for His glory. But for those who do not know the Lord, they will experience God's wrath just as the Egyptians experienced it. Verse 8, And with the blast of thy nostrils the waters were gathered together, the flood stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in, in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretched out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto the holy habitation." The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm they shall be as still as a stone. 
till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God is good. He is worthy of our praise. I almost put that in there. God is good and, and all the time. But I thought I'd be a little bit more creative and say God is good. He is worthy of our praise. What I want you to see by way of observation as we read that, I want to take note of a few things. And that is first, recall the, the context the children of Israel just walked across the Red Sea on dry land. The Egyptian army, they were drowned in the sea. The Israelites saw that. They experienced God's power. They experienced a miraculous deliverance. And what did they do after they experienced God's deliverance, God's goodness? What did they do? They sang. They praised God. They sang a song. These words reveal what the children of Israel did. They burst forth in the song. And the song depicts a very clear focus. Notice in verse 1, it opens with God's glorious triumph over the Egyptians. And down in verse 18, it closes with God's everlasting reign. The theme of the song, the focus of the song is God. God's glorious. God is triumphant. In fact, the word Lord, the Hebrew term Yahweh or Jehovah, which we've seen in previous messages, this word appears ten times in these 18 verses. In addition, in verse 2, the word Yah, instead of Yahweh, the word Yah is found in verse 2. It likewise is translated in all caps, Lord. And also down in verse 17, the word Lord is in upper and lower caps, which depicts the Hebrew term Adonai. So in essence, the word Lord is referenced 12 times in these 18 verses. Wherein is the focus? The focus of this song is on God. The focus of this song was on their good God. You see, worry was displaced by worship. And whenever you are worried, whenever you are anxious, whenever you are afraid, I invite you to praise our good God. Notice second the word horse and rider. Not just horse, not just rider, but horse and rider. In other words, the Lord's victory over the Egyptians included both the instrument of war, the horse, and the agent of war, the rider. In other words, God's victory, God's conquest was complete. His triumph was total. Notice that he is a man of war. I've read this. I've read this passage to our nation's war fighters. I've read this passage to our special operations forces. And when I read the fact that the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is His name, you should have seen the looks I received from our nation's war fighters. It was as if, that's in there? Our God is a man of war. In other words, our God is a warrior. Our God is mighty in battle. 
He is the achiever of great victories. We've already seen last week in chapter 14 that the Lord shall fight for you. Why does He fight for His people? He fights for His people because He is a man of war. Martin Luther in his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I quoted one of the verses last week. I'm going to quote another one this week. Martin Luther wrote, Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side? The man of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is He. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. Lord Sabaoth, Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. A term that's used 285 times in the Old Testament. Our God is a man of war. Notice also this term, blast of thy nostrils. We saw last week in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 21, the strong east wind. And today we read the blast of thy nostrils. These two statements, these two phrases are two sides of the same coin. It's one way of communicating the same truth. You see, the parting of the sea is miraculous because it is the result of a strong east wind. And God's snorting is a poetic way of communicating that message. To call the wind a nostril blast is simply to say that the wind is His. It's interesting that in the Hebrew text, the Hebrew word ruach, is translated wind, it's also translated spirit. The same in the New Testament, in the Greek text, the word pneuma is the word spirit. It's also translated wind. The wind is His. He owns it. It belongs to Him. It's His to command as easy as it is for you and me to breathe in and to breathe out. Notice the word mercy. It's the word chesed. It identifies one of the most important terms in the Hebrew Old Testament. Oftentimes, some people equate and use interchangeably the word mercy and the word grace, but I believe it prudent to differentiate between the two. And mercy simply denotes God's goodness, God's kindness, and God's steadfast love that is exercised toward those who are suffering. Grace, on the other hand, is simply God's favor and blessings that's exercised toward those who are unworthy. Said differently, not getting what we do deserve, that is the wrath of God, not getting what we do deserve is mercy. Getting what we do not deserve, God's favor and blessings, is grace. Mercy is the answer to our hopelessness. Grace is the answer to our helplessness. And as we have freely received God's mercy and grace, we are to freely give away God's mercy and grace to other people. To the person at the checkout line to the person who pulls out in front of us, to the person who treats us bad at work. Freely we have been given. Freely we to extend His mercy, His grace. Another key term here is the word redeemed. It's the Hebrew term ga'el, which means to deliver or to buy back. Those of you who are familiar with the book of Ruth, you know that Boaz, he is the Goel, he is the kinsman redeemer. Specifically as it relates to his his actions toward Ruth in Ruth chapter 4 of that Old Testament book. It also suggests a close personal relationship 
between the Redeemer and the redeemed. See, the biblical idea is that God redeemed you and me. He bought us back. He bought us back through the atoning and sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, His Son. Why did He do that? He did it to have a personal relationship with you and me. See, it's not about religion. It's all about relationship. Now let's put all of these terms together and interpret what this means. Number one, it means that the Lord is good and as a result, He is determined to achieve a total victory over His people's foes. You remember the map that I plastered up here a couple of times to this series of sermons? And in particular, the map of Exodus chapter 14, verse 2, where God directed the children of Israel to turn around and then go and encamp by the sea. Remember that? In essence, God appeared to lead His children down into a cul-de-sac, a difficult spot, a valley with mountains to the west and the sea to the east. And from a human perspective, the change of course appeared ill-advised. It was a, a route that would seem difficult because it seemed, it appeared to result in the destruction of the Israelites. And yet from a divine perspective, we realize through that chapter that the Lord was at work both for His glory as well as for the good of the Israelites. And as a result of what God did, we find in Exodus 14 verses 30 and 31 that they believed and they feared God. You see, in the end, we find out here in Exodus 15 that the troops were drowned. There's an interesting word in verse 10. Notice in your Bibles the word sank. It's a very descriptive word. It means that they went gurgling down. Very graphic term. You see... In Exodus chapter 1 and verse 22, Pharaoh ordered the Jewish baby boys drowned in the Nile River. Now 14 chapters later, God sent the Egyptian army gurgling down, drowned in the Red Sea. What goes around comes around. And God is determined to achieve total victory for His people. The lesson is clear. It is the will of God that gives meaning and purpose to your life and my life. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's the will of God that gives meaning and purpose to life. There's always a bigger picture that we can't see. But rest assured, each battle belongs to the Lord and the ultimate outcome of the war is never in doubt. The Lord will achieve a total victory over His people's foes. Second, the Lord is good. He is determined to bring His redeemed people into His holy habitation. God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt the land of bondage, so that He could bring them into Canaan, the land of blessing. God brought the children of Israel to the Red Sea so that He could bring them through the Red Sea on dry ground. Likewise, God has redeemed us through the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has taken us out. He has bought us. He has redeemed us. He's taken us out of the slave market of sin and He has delivered us 
into an eternal relationship with His dear Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Amen. What a beautiful hymn. The Lord is determined to bring His redeemed people into His holy habitation. What does all of this mean? Let me make some applications that you and I can put into practice. Number one, the Lord designs to give us strength. I want to focus your attention here. I want to pinpoint your attention on one verse Look with me at verse 2 of chapter 15. It says, The Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. By way of application, I would say this, The Lord designs to give us strength. Moses in this song, he, he wrote these words, The Lord is my strength. That's a theme that's repeated throughout the Word of God in Deuteronomy 33, 25. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Isaiah 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Isaiah 41, 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. And who could forget Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Robert Morgan summarizes this concept by saying from Genesis to Revelation we find this simple formula. When the Word of God goes in and praises go up and faith goes out, God goes forth to deliver His people and give them His strength. The Lord designs to give us strength. Second, the Lord deserves to hear our songs. Notice Moses says in verse 2, The Lord is my strength and my song. Now what I want you to see here is something very peculiar. Notice these terms, strength, song, salvation. Strength, song, salvation. In the biblical text, word order is significant. Not only are the words important, but the word order is important. Now notice Moses says, strength, song, salvation, deliverance. But what happened was the reverse. The Israelites, they broke out in song after the deliverance, not before the deliverance. 
They were not in a state of praise prior to crossing the Red Sea. They were in a state of panic. And it was only after God delivered them, it was only after God saved them that they burst forth into song. But Moses, in reflecting on that, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, God is my strength, God is my song, God is my salvation. And what I take from that is this. Number one, the Lord is to be our song. The Lord is to be our song. He is the subject. He is the central piece. He is the focus of our praise. Paul writes that the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The chief characteristic of biblical songs is the lack of focus on one's self. The songs of Scripture focus on God, who He is, and what He's done for His people. You see, all week long, all week long, our natural Tendency, our depraved nature forces us to think about and focus on ourselves. And then we come together as a community of faith and we sing as a community of faith. And our focus changes and we're taken away from what we have thought and we're taken to what we should be thinking, what we should be feeling, what we should be experiencing when our focus is right, when our focus is on God. That's why it's so important to gather together as a community of faith because we're reminded week in and week out that the focus is not on me. It's on you. I got an amen. <laughs> and the second lesson that the Lord deserves to hear our songs is this even before deliverance occurs, we should make it a habit to praise our God. He is my strength. He is my song. He is my salvation. Before I'm delivered, I should make it a habit to praise my God. Let me say this. Before we get a pastor, we need to make it a habit to praise our God because He is going to provide us a pastor. May it be said of Spring Valley Baptist Church, not that we praised God after He provided us a pastor, but we praised God before He provided us a pastor. He is my strength. He is my song. He is my Savior. The Lord desires to be our Savior. You see, the beauty of this entire historical narrative is that the all-wise, the ever-present, the all-powerful, the sovereign and good God of heaven and earth, He made Himself lovingly accessible to you and me through the person of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice what Moses says. He says, the Lord is my strength. 
He's my strength and song. And He has become my salvation. Notice what He says later. Same verse. He is my God. Question is, can you say that this morning? Is He your Savior? Is He your Sovereign? Is He your God? See, it doesn't matter if He's mine. It doesn't matter if He's my mom and dad's. What matters is, is that He's your Savior. Are you in relationship? Are you in relationship with Him? When we're in relationship, we will move from worry to worship because our focus will not be on our circumstances. It will be on our Savior. Now let me ask you this question. We have the goodness of God that desires our best. We have the wisdom of God to plan for our best. And we have the power of God to achieve our best. What more do we want? We lack nothing. Those who have God and everything else do not have any more than the man or the woman who just has God only. So with the goodness of God, to desire our very best, the wisdom of God to plan it, to orchestrate it, to bring it to fruition, and the power of God to achieve it. What do we lack? We lack nothing. We have everything because He is our sovereign. He is our Savior. Is He yours? Would you bow with me? Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive us when we take our eyes off of you and place them on our situations and circumstances. Forgive us for waiting to praise you till after the answer to our prayers. May we praise you early on and often, trusting you to deliver in your own unique way and in your own perfect time. Father, this day I commit to you these who have given their undivided attention to listen. I pray that today if someone does not know you as their Savior, that today they would trust you. And Father, for those who are here today that are looking for a church home and desire for this place to be their church home, I pray that you would lead them here and that they would make that decision today. Perhaps they have trusted you, they're in relationship with you, but they've yet to be baptized and Maybe you've been speaking to them about that. God, whatever the needs are this day, I pray that people would respond to you in obedience and trust and faith. And I pray that you, in all things, would receive the glory and the praise. For it's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing?
This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me, this is my desire to God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to join hands right here. I'm going to ask Mike if he would to come for just a moment. We'll do the introductions first here. This is Richard and Nina. They uh, come to Zion Membership Church here. Born again Christians, baptized. And they're from New Jersey. So if anybody here from New Jersey, come on down here and meet them. <laughs> Welcome them. Amen. I'll get the last name later. <laughs> all right, we can drop our hands and clap one time, all right? <laughs> Let's join hands and ask God's blessings upon our community. Father, we love you today, and we thank you for your grace and your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that when we when we're caught between the devil and the deep Red Sea, that you're there with us. And God, may we be reminded that oftentimes you led us there. So may we sense your presence, may we rest in you, and may you trust us to deliver, or trust you to deliver, because the same God who led us there will lead us through. And we rejoice in that today. Thank you for Richard, for Nina, their desire to become a part of this body the body of Christ here at Spring Valley Baptist Church. May we make them feel welcome and at home. And God, we praise you because we know you have someone to come here and be our under-shepherd. And we're trusting you and we're praising you because you're at work even now. You're at work moving and ministering and guiding and directing. And you will provide, for you are indeed Jehovah Jireh. And we bless your name today through Christ our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 God's blessings to you. Would you make our new members feel welcome?